Good morning. Welcome to the Liberty Church of Christ uh, for our Sunday morning worship. And here we find ourselves together again online. We re really appreciate you uh, being with us and joining us online. We are sad and hate that we have to be online, but we're thankful that we have the technology to do it. We certainly miss you looking out. Uh, I see a couple that have come and appreciate that so much. It'll make it a lot more encouraging and easier to, to speak, but uh, uh, we are grateful that everybody has gathered together, even if it is online. Uh, we do have a few announcements to make before we begin our worship. Let's make those now. The Pine Vale Children's Home has a fall pantry drive like they have every year, and the items will be picked up October the 4th. So uh, be sure to bring those items, and those items is brown or powdered sugar, and then Dawn dish detergent and cooking oil. So if you'll get those to the building before October the 4th, that would be great. Also, there's a bridal shower for Marcy, Marcy Thorne. It's easy for me to say. Uh, that's next week, and that will be from 1.30 to 3 o'clock in the shower room. So uh, the selections are found at Walmart, Amazon.com, and Bed, uh, Bath, and Beyond. Congratulations to Danny Goza. Had a great, great grandson. His name is Amos Monroe Delaney. He was born uh, September the 16th, and he was eight pounds. He's 22 inches long, and he's the son of Zach and Kara. Sympathy needs to be mentioned for the family of June Franks Booker. She's the widow of Al Franks of the Magnolia Messenger. And she passed away this past week, I had a stroke, and that took her home to be with the Lord. So be with that in prayer for that family. Also keep in mind Charlotte Hutchison. She's in the hospital, but I uh, talked to Ginger, and she's doing some better. She's responding well to the medi medication. And then there are several with COVID. We want to continue to remember all those with COVID. Uh, Case and Anderson uh, contracted COVID, and then Andrew Anderson got COVID. Uh, Jessica Jackson told us that Paisley got COVID, and uh, Cloy was very, very sick. And I haven't heard from Cloy uh, until the day before yesterday, but she was very sick at that time, but continue to pray for that entire family. Arlene Carr, remember she was in the hospital. She was able to go home. We're glad of that, but she's very, very weak, so keep her in prayer. Christy White, that's Van Roberts' sister. She has cancer, and she's dealing with that, so pray for her. Jonathan Smith in the community was added to the prayer list this week. He's a 32-year-old who had to go to the intensive care unit in Tupelo Hospital. And Donna Hester posted that uh, for us to be in prayer for a Teresa Childers. Some of you may know Teresa Childers. She, too, had to uh, go to the Tupelo Hospital this past week. Joan Sparks, she has been in the hospital for quite a while, and she had a very critical turn. Family came in, and they were worried about her, gave her like 24 hours to turn around. Well, as of yesterday, she was still with us. Uh, don't know about since yesterday, so uh, if you know about that, uh, uh, let us know, but Joan Sparks. That's all the announcements I have at this time. Uh, we'll have our opening prayer to begin our worship. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for allowing us to be together. We realize, Father, that you are God. You're the one and only true God. We honor you, we worship you, we adore you. We pray, Father, that you will be with those that we mentioned here in the announcements just a moment ago. We pray that you will be with those with COVID. We pray that you will be with those in the hospital with various problems. We ask that you will bless those that have lost their dear loved ones. We ask you, Father, to keep your hand upon them all, and not only them, but all of those that we have in our minds and our hearts. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless us throughout this worship. We pray that you will find that it is a sweet-smelling savor that comes up before you. Even though we're in different places, we are, our hearts are bound and knit together. Please forgive us when we do wrong and help us to do better. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
We have with us uh, Carrie Deaton and also Ron and Pat, so we're glad of everybody and the Mitchells are here. So uh, Carrie Deaton is going to lead our singing this morning and he'll also at the appropriate time lead our closing prayer. So at this time, uh, uh, get your song books out that you may have there at home. He'll be doing this from the, the paper book that we've sent home. So get that out and uh, turn the service over to Brother Kerry. Number 550, won't it be wonderful there? After this, David will bring our lesson. <clears throat> When with the Savior we enter the glory line, won't it be wonderful there? Indeed, the troubles and cares of the story line, won't it be wonderful there? Oh, won't it be wonderful there? Having no burdens to bear, joyously singing. Heart bells are ringing, oh, won't it be wonderful there? There where the tempest will never be sweeping us, won't it be wonderful there? Sure that forever the Lord will be keeping us, won't it be wonderful there? Oh, won't it be wonderful there, having no burdens to bear, joyously singing with heart bells are ringing, oh, won't it be wonderful there. At the appropriate time, the Lord's uh, Supper song of the Lord. Uh, 228 uh, will be the song that we'll be singing next for the Lord's Supper. So go ahead and get that if you have your books and be prepared for that. Why forgive? The children in the Liberty Land classes from kindergarten to the fifth grade have been studying Joseph. Now you remember last month when we were out because of the COVID, uh, we... We did a lesson on Joseph because that was the month that they would have studied Joseph. Well, when they came back, they went right back into Joseph. Now, we did a lesson on Joseph, and we're going to do another lesson on Joseph because that's what they're studying instead of Moses, which was what the original schedule was. But we're going to do another lesson on uh, Joseph. Now, this is not the last Sunday of the month. We normally do that on the last Sunday of the month for the Liberty Land classes. But Jimmy Moody is scheduled, uh, Lord willing, to preach for us on Sunday morning, uh, the last Sunday of the month, uh, the 26th, next week. So I thought we would go ahead and do a lesson on Joseph. And you young people have been studying Joseph this past month or these last couple of weeks. And last time we looked at Joseph's character and how that it was a strong character. And we compared and contrasted him with Daniel. We saw how Daniel was a strong character. But tonight, today, let's look at Joseph's great characteristic, that strong characteristics of his ability and willingness to forgive. How important that is. Now, Joseph's story is found in Genesis chapter number 37 through chapter 50. So go ahead and get your Bibles. We'll be looking at a few scriptures just bouncing back and forth from chapter 37 through 50. We're not going to look at the entire story of Joseph in terms of each chapter. But from chapter 37 to chapter 50 in, in, encapsulates the story of Joseph. Now, chapter 38 in that section deals with Judah. And, and the sin that he did with Tamar, if, the problems that he had there. But it was Judah that is going to in, insist on selling Joseph into slavery. So Judah's got a, a problem in this, but it is him 
that is going to be the most to stand up for Benjamin, Joseph's brother, later on. So he has a complete turn in his character as well and his remorse for what he did against Joseph and against his father Jacob. But from chapters 37 to 50, and if you even pull out the chapter 38 that deals with Judah, there are still 13 chapters that deal with Joseph. That's 26%. A quarter of the whole book of Genesis is dedicated to Joseph. And one of the things, my favorite part of the story uh, of Joseph is when he showed that forgiveness to his brothers. And we're going to see why it's important to forgive. The first thing we're going to look at in terms of why forgive is if you're going to be a follower of Christ, a follower of God, we have to forgive. We really have no choice but to forgive. You remember when Peter came to Jesus and he told Jesus or asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? This is found in Matthew chapter 18, verse uh, 22 and 21. He said, how many times? Seven times? Is that enough? And Jesus said in verse 22, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, that's not a literal number. What he's saying is any time, all the time. So Jesus' advice and commandment to Peter and thus to us is that we are supposed to forgive. We are commanded to forgive. Even Jesus gave us an example to forgive when he was on the cross. His killers were down there. And what the cross victim would often do is curse the killers. But Jesus didn't. He asked God to forgive the killers. Folks, that is a great example. However, Jesus in a parable told us point blank that we must forgive. If we're going to be a follower of Christ, a Christian, we must. In Matthew 18, verse 35, which is a parable that he told to Peter when Peter asked him how many times to forgive, here's what he says in verse 35 when he gave a parable of somebody who were not willing to forgive and was condemned for it. Here's what he said in 1835. So likewise, that means condemnation, shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your heart forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. If I am not willing to forgive, then my Father will not forgive me. God will not forgive me. Here's what Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Folks, we can't get any plainer than that. That's about as plain as you can be. And somebody may say, well, I just can't forgive. Oh, they did something awful to me 15, 20 years ago, and I cannot do it. Do you think, honestly, that God, Jesus, would command us to do something that we just can't do? I don't think he would. Anything that he commands us to do, we have the ability to do it. It's just that do we have the willingness to do it? You know, we often say that I know the Bible teaches that I've got to be baptized. That's a commandment. And I know the Bible teaches that I've got to worship him. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And we embrace that. Oh, and I know the Bible teaches that we've got to do this, that, and the other. We certainly have to believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. So we know we've got to have all these things. And so we're willing to yield to those commandments. However, sometimes when it comes to forgiveness, we don't think we have to do that. Well, that's not something that's, that's a commandment. It's a point-blank commandment. If we want to be a follower of God, then we've got to forgive. Joseph certainly showed that example because he understood that his actions in life, whether he sinned or not sinned, he lived righteously or not lived like, it was for or against God. When Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him to do something bad, Joseph said, I'm not going to do it. 
and, and it wasn't so much that he said, I'm not going to do it because it's a sin against your body, or I'm not going to do it because it's a sin against Potiphar, even though he understood that Potiphar had trusted him so much, but, and I'm not going to do it because it's a sin against my own body. Here's what he said in Genesis 39, verse number 9. He says, how then, at the lower part of that verse, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Folks, when we do wicked things, we're sinning against God. And God says, forgiveness is something I require from you. And if I'm not willing to forgive, and I don't uh, work my character in such a way that I have the ability to forgive, then I'm sinning against God. That's as plain as we can stop preaching right now. And that is a, a, a plenty enough for us to say, why forgive? It's because we're commanded to, if we want to be a follower of Christ. But let's move on. There's other reasons to forgive. It frees. Forgiveness will free us. It certainly will free us to serve. If, if I'm not willing to forgive someone, then I'm certainly not going to be in a position to serve them. Listen to Genesis 39. And get your Bibles and read along with us. Genesis 39, verse number 3. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. This is Potiphar. He understood that God was with Joseph and that the Lord made all that he had did or he did to prosper in his hand. Potiphar recognized that. Verse 4, and Joseph found grace in his sight. And look at the next part of that verse. He served him. And of course, he made him overseer over his house and all that he had put into his hand. He put it into his hand. Folks, what if Joseph had embittered himself and when he was sold to those traveling Midianites and, uh, and he was sold over into Potiphar's hand, what if Joseph had have said, I am so bitter against my brothers? Now, he didn't like it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we have to like our plight, but he was able to deal with it. And if he had so embittered himself then he would have never been able to serve, never served Potiphar. What right do you have? I'm a free man under God's people, he could have said. But he didn't. He said, I will serve you. Being willing to forgive will empower us to serve and free us to serve. In Genesis 41, skip over a couple of chapters. Look at verse 16. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. When Pharaoh had that dream, and nobody knew how to interpret the dream, and he called Joseph out of prison and said, I heard that you can interpret dreams. Interpret this dream for me. Here's what Joseph told Pharaoh. It is not in me. I'm not doing this. I, I, I know that God is behind everything I do or don't do. He is in everything that, that I prosper or don't prosper. I can't interpret your dreams, but God can. When we put God as the center of our lives and understand we either sin against God or it's God working in us, then it frees us and empowers us to serve. What if our inability or unwillingness to forgive stops us from serving and helping. Folks, that is misery. Another thing it does, as far as freedom goes, it frees the one who seeks our forgiveness. I want you to think about that for just a moment. It frees the one who wants to be forgiven. Go over to Genesis 45, verse number 5. This is when the brothers have come, and they didn't recognize Joseph at first, but he finally made himself known to them. And he told them this when he revealed himself. Now, therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me hither, for God 
did send me before you to preserve life. Those boys were sick at heart. You know the story. They did it ruthlessly when they sold him into slavery. But by the end of the story, they were sick because they saw what it did to their daddy. And they had great remorse. And, and they thought they were being punished for their sin against Joseph. After so many years, it was in their craw, as it were. And Joseph said, I'm forgiving you. And, and do not let it grieve you. Don't let it, don't be angry with yourself. When you and I are willing to forgive someone who has done us wrong and they seek our forgiveness, then we should forgive them to free them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 7, that's the story of where the man who was caught in 1 Corinthians uh, with his, he was having an affair with his stepmother and Paul told them to disfellowship him. They did. Well, in 2 Corinthians... Chapter number 2, it's evident that the guy repented, and he wanted to be back with them. And the church there were not willing to do that. Uh, they were saying, no, Paul told us to disfellowship you. We're going to disfellowship you. Well, Paul gave them great insight. And here's what he said in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 7. So that, contrary wise against what you're doing, you ought rather to forgive him. And comfort him. Why? Lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. If we're not willing to forgive someone, it can cause them to be in deep uh, depression and overmuch sorrow. It will free them if we'll forgive them. We're social creatures. We need each other. We need each other's approval. We need each other's encouragement. We need each other's Forgiveness. And if I refuse to forgive them or you refuse to forgive me, it can certainly put me in bondage. Now, what if somebody doesn't want my forgiveness? They could care less about my forgiveness. Whatever they did to me, they, they have no remorse. Well, I can still free myself by choosing to forgive them. Certainly, I can free myself to serve. But so many times, whether they want our forgiveness or not, uh, and we do, are not willing to forgive them, we might actually, in our humanness, uh, hurt them in some way. What if, what if we have the power over their job? Uh, they come in, we know they did something wrong to us, they don't care about it, they're not remorseful, they haven't asked our forgiveness, but yet we're a supervisor, we own a business, or we have power in some way over their lives. And because we're not willing to forgive them, we may harm them in some way. And we don't want to find ourselves in bondage to that. Forgiveness not only is something that we must do, it's something that will free us and free others. But it also may very well for, fulfill God's plan. Think about that for a moment. What if somebody has harmed us and it changed the trajectory of our lives in such a way? that we don't know why this happened and we're upset about it and we certainly don't like it, but what if it put us in a position to be able to do something that God wanted us to do all along? And of course you know that's exactly what happened with Joseph. Look at Genesis chapter 42 and look at verse 9. When those boys came to Joseph and they didn't recognize Joseph, but he immediately recognized them. Here's what the Bible says. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them. Remember those dreams? They had bowed down, or at least their sheaves had bowed down, and they had, to Joseph himself. And then when he saw his brothers bowing down in front of him, he remembered those dreams. Wow, this is the fulfillment of my dream when I was just a teenager. Sometimes these boys who did something ruthless to him, awful to him, it was fulfilling God's design for Joseph's life. In Genesis 45, verse number 5 that we just looked at a, a moment ago, the end of that verse says, when he says, don't be grieved or, or angry with yourselves, the end of that verse says, God sent me here. Why? To preserve life. The reason I'm here is to preserve your life. It's a purpose. 
You did it to me, and it, but it's to fulfill God's will. So we can recognize that sometimes people do bad things to us. It may actually help us to fulfill God's plan in our lives. And so I've got to be willing and able to forgive them because it's not them. Look at chapter 45, verse number 8 of Genesis. So now, it was not you that sent me here. It was God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all of his house, a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. It wasn't you. So we can realize in our life that what that person did to us that hurt us so badly may have put us in a position, actually, to fulfill God's plan in our life. We don't know what God's plan is. He's sovereign. He's, he's awesome. And, and He sees things that we can't see. But sometimes if I'm not willing to forgive them, then I may be standing in the way of God's plan for my life. What if Joseph, not willing to forgive these boys, he had great power. He could have snapped his finger or he could have just gave a look to one of his guards and they could have slaughtered those boys, his brothers, immediately. If he wasn't willing to forgive them, what would have happened? Well, they were the fathers of the family. He would not have preserved life. Joseph recognized that by him being sold into slavery, that he was sent to preserve life, not to destroy life, not to stop them. There would have been no Israel. There would have been no tribes because they were the fathers of the tribes of Israel. He understood that I am fulfilling God's plan and I have to be willing to forgive. Now, the last one we'll look at is he was, when he forgave, he gave finally. It, it was final. There is a statement that I've heard many times. We're going to bury the hatchet. You know what that means. You've got a problem with me. I've got a problem with you. We've got an issue. Tell you what, let's forgive it and let's bury the hatchet. But someone once said, some people bury the hatchet, but they leave the handle sticking out so that they can grab it when they need it and pull it out of the ground and go ahead and use it against the other fellow. No, Joseph, when he buried the hatchet, it was over. It was final. We oftentimes will forgive as long as the conditions are right. Well, turn out best. Well, you're not really hurting me now. But if you change the conditions, then my inability or my unwillingness to forgive will come back, and, and I'll hold it against you again. Not Joseph. In Genesis 45, verse number 15, we see that beautiful scene. He says, Moreover, he, Joseph, kissed all of his brethren and wept upon them. I love that scene. He, he said, I'm your brother Joseph. He sent everybody else out. His brothers and he were alone. I'm your brother Joseph, whom you sold into slavery. Don't be grieved. Don't be angry. I forgive you. And I, he kissed them. He wept on them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. That's relationship. They, they had a conversation. Folks, when we forgive others, we can rebuild the relationship. We can restore the relationship. And remember, Joseph made the first move. They hadn't asked for Joseph's forgiveness. They haven't said, oh, Joseph, would you please forgive me? They didn't even know that he was Joseph. Joseph made the first move. And sometimes we'll say to ourselves, I don't have to forgive them because they haven't asked me for forgiveness. Be careful about that interpretation. Joseph forgave them without them even asking. And he had the power to slaughter them, but he didn't. He hugged them. He kissed them. He wept on them. And he restored the relationship, making that first move. But now later, after he goes and gets Jacob, brings them all into uh, Goshen, and they are raised there for a little while, we're going to see that Jacob dies. The father dies. And these boys now are very worried. Why? Because conditions have changed circumstances have changed. He may still be mad at us. Maybe he didn't, maybe he, he forgave us and didn't kill us because of our father's sake. But now that daddy's dead, he'll get that hatchet and pull it back out and, and kill us all. 
They became very worried. Look at Genesis 50, beginning at verse number 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, here's what they said, Joseph will peradventure, that's the word perhaps, perhaps Joseph will hate us. Remember what we did to him? It was so bad. Now that daddy's dead, conditions have changed, circumstances have changed, he's going to hate us. He will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. Verse 16. So they sent a messenger unto Joseph. Not, they didn't even go themselves. They sent a messenger to him saying, Your father did command before he died. They, they're saying, now listen to what your daddy said. So shall ye say unto Joseph. Here's what he told me to tell you. What? Forgive. I pray thee now the trespasses of thy servants of God thy father. Please forgive your brothers. And Joseph wept when he heard that they were begging for forgiveness. He wept when they spoke to him. Verse 18. Now his brethren also went. Now they fell down before his face. Now he had already forgiven them. He had already wept on them and hugged them. And daddy came down and lived for a little while and blessed them and all of that. And now they're still asking his forgiveness. They're begging his forgiveness. They said, we be thy servants. Verse 19, Joseph said unto them, fear not, for am I in the place of God? Look, God is the one that did all of this. Don't be afraid. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. I still haven't forgot that. He says, he meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now, therefore, fear ye not. I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly to them. He, he continued to restore and solidify that relationship. Folks, here's the point. When you forgive somebody, forgive them. When you let it go, let it go. Now, you're going to remember, Joseph hadn't forgotten that they had sold him into slavery. Joseph hadn't forgotten how horrible it was to be a slave to Potiphar and be in jail those many years and, and, and everything he had to go through. He hadn't forgotten it, but he let it go. When you forgive, forgive. Joseph was first in his forgiveness, and he was final in his forgiveness. But Joseph also realized this. He said, I am not in the place of God. I can forgive somebody, but that does not mean that God did. If somebody stole something from me, I might forgive them, but that doesn't mean God did. If they have not come to Father and have not believed in Jesus as the Son of God and repented of their sins, He will not forgive them, whether you did or not. The final forgiveness, the ultimate forgiveness, is from God. Folks, you do not have to have the church's approval. You do not have to have the church's forgiveness or an elder's forgiveness or a preacher's forgiveness or a teacher's forgiveness or somebody. You don't have to have those forgiveness. But you've got to have God's forgiveness. We encourage you, if you want to follow God, if you want to set yourself free, if you want to fulfill God's plan in your life, restore relationships, and if you want to experience final forgiveness, then we encourage you to obey the gospel. It's God's plan for your life, for my life. So I know we're worshiping virtual, but we're still offering an invitation in the sense that you can give us a call. You can get in contact with our eldership. Get in contact uh, with us and let us know how we can serve. We keep the baptistry waters ready 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're warm and you can come and we will assist you in baptism. But if you say, you know what? I've been holding a grudge against somebody that's already dead. It's 20 years ago. Free yourself and ask God to forgive you. Why? Because if you haven't forgiven them, God will not forgive you and you may ask for the prayers of the congregation and let us pray for you and God will forgive you today we have worshiped virtually 
We sang, pray, preach, take the Lord's Supper, and give. That's what we're going to do now. Uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper, and we're going to give of our means. Uh, it's uh, such a wonderful blessing to have you with us. So go ahead and get the song ready that has been pronounced, announced, and get your communion su uh, supplies ready. And then we will get together and worship with communion. Right after Carrie Deaton leads us in this song to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. The old rugged cross will sing verses one and two. <clears throat> On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a Preparing our communion supplies so that we can observe this item of worship that we refer to as the Lord's Supper. This unleavened bread which we're about to take is representative to us as Christians as the body of Christ. Let's be grateful for it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Jesus Christ, your Son, who had a body prepared for him, that he could come and sacrifice that body for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we pray that as we take this bread, that we'll do so in a manner that pleases you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This fruit of the vine that we're about to partake is the blood of Jesus Christ to us as Christians, so let's be thankful for that. Father God in heaven, it's in like manner that we thank you for this fruit of the vine, fruit of the grape vine. We pray, Father, that as we as Christians together in this place as well as in the homes of our members of this congregation all over, we pray that we will take it in a way that pleases you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Another item of worship that God commands us to do upon the first day of the week, let us lay by in store as God has prospered us. The, the 10% came from the Old Testament tithing, but actually if you look at all the giving that they did in the Old Testament, it was probably more like 50 to 60% of their income. But God has told us not an exact figure. He said, do it uh, as you've been prospered. Do it with a cheerful heart because God loves a cheerful giver. So we're blessed. And we have an opportunity to worship God by giving. Let's do that at this time and show thanks for our blessings. Father God, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you pour out upon us, especially here in America, especially here in our community. We pray, Father, as we give back a portion of what you have blessed us with, that we will do so with that cheerful heart because we know that you want us to have a, a liberal and a giving spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray our prayer. Once again, we thank you so much for joining us for our Sunday morning worship. We will be worshiping this evening at, at uh, about 4.35 o'clock. It'll be up. And rec remember, uh, we will be posting that. Uh, should be up by 5, so just, just tune in. We'll send out the message to do that. And you can see it on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, at this time, Brother Kerry is going to come and lead us in a closing song, and then he will direct our minds in our closing prayer. See you tonight. Sing the first and last verse of When We All Get to Heaven. That'll be number 258. You have a song book. 258. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus will sing and shout the victory. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we've had this opportunity to come and worship you, to sing songs of praise to your name, to hear your word proclaimed, and remember the death of Jesus as he suffered on the cross at the Lord's Supper. We pray that our worship today has been acceptable to you and it has been in the spirit and in truth we pray that all those that were mentioned that were sick we pray that you would be with them and be with those that are tending to them and uh, pray that you will heal them and bring them back to their normal walks of life as if it be your will we pray that you would be with those that have grieving over lost loved ones we pray that you would comfort them and give them Give them peace. Um, most of all, dear Lord, we want you to, we ask that you be with those that are spiritually sick because their soul is lost and they are, I pray that they will make a change for it's everlastingly too late. Pray that you would be with this congregation as we um, strive to do your will daily and we pray that this pandemic will soon pass and that we'll be able to be with be together again as a congregation um, be with all those that are sick 
be with all those that missionaries, be with our elders, be with them as they make the decisions that uh, affect this congregation. Pray that you would be with us through our rest of our walks of life and, and um, pray that at the end of life's journey that heaven will be our eternal home. These things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.